Okay, so we're back from the break and we're going to continue with section 3.1 and the information about uh, probability. So I'm going to share that PowerPoint again. And going back to where we were, oh, I was going to show you this here. So here is the solution for that car problem we were just looking at. This has the complete tree diagram. So it says there are three choices for manufacturers, two car sizes, four, and four colors. And then they show how to get the total number of possible cars by using the fundamental counting principle. And then they have a tree diagram there to show um, for as a, as a check. You can imagine that if you have a lot of choices for certain things, that uh, drawing a tree diagram can be pretty uh, involved, difficult. So using the fundamental counting principle is preferred unless you need a visual for what all the choices are. The nice thing about the tree diagram is it does show you everything about it. So um, that's, there's an advantage in that. Um, here's another example using fundamental counting principles. So let's look at this one. It says the access code for a car security system consists of four digits. Each digit can be any number from zero to nine. And notice that they created four slots for the four digits. So I'm going to draw this up here too. And on the first one, so when it says each digit can be any number from 0 to 9, you have to realize that that's actually 10 numbers. Because you have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. You have uh, 0, and then you have up to 9. So it's 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So that's actually 10 digits, okay? So 10 possibilities for each number. And it says um, how many access codes are possible when, and on number one, it says each digit can be used only once and not repeated. Uh, so no repeats for this first used once and no repeats for this first option here. So I'm going to show you how to do that using the fundamental counting rule uh, that we talked about a minute ago. So, for the first one, we have 10 choices, the numbers 0 through 9. But whatever number we used here, we can't use again. We can't have any repeats, and each number can only be used once in this first scenario. So that means for the second number, there's nine numbers left. Now I've used up two, so I have eight left here and seven left here. So now using the funda fundamental uh, counting rule, I would multiply these. These aren't the numbers. These are the number of available options. So for the first number, I had 10 options, then 9 options, then 8 options, then 7 options. And if I multiply these all together, then it's like 90 times 56. So that for this first answer, we have 5,040 ways if we have if we use them once with no repeats. Okay, so let's look at option two. It makes me go through the whole uh, thing again every time. Sorry about that. Option two. Option two says each digit can be repeated. So for option two, we can have repeats. So I have four slots again. So this is option one, option two. We still have four slots to fill. We have 10 options. For the first slot, the numbers 0 through 9, but we can repeat them. And it doesn't say we're limited at all. So that means we have the same 10 options for the second digit 
and the same 10 options here and the same 10 options there. And if we uh, multiply 10 times 10 times 10 times 10, you're going to get a 1 with four zeros. So for answer 2, we have 10,000 different options. And then there was a third question on this. So let's look at the third question. It says each digit can be repeated, but the first digit cannot be 0 or 1. So I'm going to write down, so repeats are allowed. But we have um, a restriction. It says the first digit, just the first one, can't be 0 or 1. Okay, so I wrote that down. So here's our third option. Four slots. Repeats are allowed, but this first digit can't be zero or one. So that takes away two of our options for the first digit. So instead of having 10 options, we weigh the zero and the one. So there's only eight options for the first digit. But the other ones don't have that restriction. So we still have 10 options here, 10 options here, and 10 options here because it said repeats are allowed. So now we multiply those together, and that's going to be, well, those three tens multiply to 1,000 times 8, and that's going to be 8,000 different codes if you don't let the first number be a 0 or a 1. So this is how you can use the fundamental principle of counting to find out how many different uh, combinations of things are available. Oh, sorry. So every time I have to go through this again. Okay, the next thing we're talking about are two types of probability. Well, actually, I suppose there's really three types. We're only going to talk, really deal with two types. So the first type of probability is classical or theoretical probability, where it says each outcome in a sample space is equally likely. And note, I want you to notice that where they put P and then they have an E in parentheses. And we're going to talk about what that notation means. And then they're giving you a formula. It says equals the number of outcomes in E. I'm going to write that a little bit different. And divided by the total number of outcomes in the sample space. Now, I've written that a little bit differently, so I'm going to unshare here so that on the recording this will show up. And I wrote this. First of all, I want to talk to you about what that means, this notation. This does not mean P times E. I know parentheses often mean um, multiplication, but in this case, that P, when you see a capital P like that, especially in probability and statistics, that P means probability. And in math, it's pretty common for parentheses, another common use of parentheses, and I apologize that mathematicians use the same symbol sometimes for to mean different things. But when you're talking about this, this means, this whole expression means the probability of E. That's what this expression means. The P means probability. And then the whole expression means the probability of E. So this is when you're doing classical or theoretical probability, which is what we do most. The probability of E occurring is the number of ways E can happen over the total number of possible outcomes. Let me give you an example of this. So let's suppose our experiment, let's go back to uh, rolling a die. 
And if you recall, the sample space is the numbers one through six. When you roll one die, that's your sample space. And so we have six possible outcomes. Six outcomes. And that means when we do probability about rolling a die, that bottom number is always a six. So every probability, that's going to be the bottom number. Now I'm going to do some example probabilities with that experiment. So if I write this probability of one, then what I mean is if you roll that die, what's the probability you'll get a one? Well, first I look through the sample space. I see how many ones are there. How many ways can one happen out of these six possible? Well, there's only one one, so it can happen one way out of six. So the probability of rolling a one is one over six, but the probability of rolling a two is also one over six because there's only one two. The probability of rolling a three is also one over six. In fact, the probability of rolling any of the individual numbers is one out of six. And then if you added all those probabilities up for all the possible outcomes, so you'd have one six plus one six, if you add them all up, it would add up to one or a hundred percent. Now, what if I did this? I said probability, and sometimes they'll use an X. So say X is the outcome. And let's say probability, so we're going to call X is the outcome of rolling the die. If I say, what's the probability that X is less than 3? Then for this, your bottom number is always 6. But now I'm going to count how many of those outcomes in the sample space meet this requirement, this restriction. So that says, how many of the outcomes are less than 3? Well, the only ones that are less than 3 are 2. There's 2 of them. So I would put 2 out of 6 are less than 3. And that's the probability. But we would reduce that to 1 third. So we're always going to give reduced fractions as an answer. Occasionally, they will ask you to change it to decimal form. And if they do, they'll tell you what to round to. On the test, for most of the probability questions I ask, I'm going to expect a reduced fraction. So make sure you practice giving fraction answers and reducing it. OK, another prob probability. What if I said probability that x is even? What do you think the top number in the probability is, and what is the bottom number? First of all, the bottom number should be easy, because the bottom number for every one of these is 6, because that's how many total outcomes there are. What should the top number be if I'm doing the probability that I roll an even number? You can type in the chat, or you can talk to me. Say that again, Christina. Three. three, right, because three of them are even. The ones that are even are two, four, and six. Those are the even ones. There's three of them. Remember, you're counting how many out outcomes meet the restriction. So three out of six, which we would reduce to half of them. Half of them are even. That would also be the probability that um, we roll an odd, right? Because half of them are odd. Half are odd and half are even. So that's a quick um, basic uh, description of doing classical or theoretical probability. Now, there's another kind of probability. called empirical or statistical probability. This is the kind of probability that they use to um, determine your insurance rates, your car insurance. They can't do theoretical probability. So when they're deciding how likely you are to have an accident, they use empirical probability based on observations. 
So for each age group, they may look at historically during a certain period of time, how many people in this age group had a bad accident or a, an accident that damaged the car or something like that. And, and that would cause, would generate or inform the rates that they're going to charge for that age group. So that's why you have different rates, you know, for teenagers. It's because uh, empirically, statistically, based on observations, they um, have more accidents, more, uh, what do you call it, accidents that damage the car. They have more than, than non-teenagers. So on this one, you see it says empirical probabilities based on observations and it is the relative, it's the same thing as relative frequency. So I'm going to write this. This is a little bit different. So this first one, we more often do theoretical or classical. But this also comes up a lot, especially in real life. So I'm going to write this formula down, and we're going to talk about this a little bit. Notice it still starts off with the probability of an event, and it says equals the frequency of the event. And we should really put the frequency observed. So, or observed frequency of event E over the total frequency or the total number of observations. I'm going to write that a little bit different. I'm going to say the total number of observations. So for empirical or statistical, notice how I reworded this. I kind of like the way I've worded it here better than the way they worded it. So your top number is the observed frequency of E. That means you're actually looking at something, and you divide by the total number of observations. So I have a really good example of this, and I think some of you have heard this before, so uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> but here's my example of this. So Theoretically, when you talk about tossing a coin, so I'm going to come back up here to theoretical probability. The probability of tossing either heads or tails, let's say tossing tails on a coin, a fair coin, is one half because there's one one side of the two is a tail, and there are two sides total. Now, that's the theoretical probability. But does that mean every time, say, if I toss the coin 100 times, does that mean exactly 50 will come out heads and exactly 50 will come out tails? Well, no, it doesn't mean that. So if you actually do an observed probability, it could come off slightly off. Now, the more observations, the more times you flip the coin, the closer it'll probably be to evening out. Like if you did a hundred, if you flipped it a hundred times, that's quite a bit. It probably won't be 50 and 50 because that would be just that would just be sort of unusual to have it come out exactly half hail, uh, tails and half heads, um, or if you mix those hails, but half tails and half heads. If you did if you did it a hundred, if you did it a thousand, it'd be even more likely to be half and half. And that's called the law of large numbers. The more times you repeat, the more observations you make, the more likely the observed probability will come out to be the theoretical probability. So here's my story. I have an a, a, a true story about an empirical or statistical probability. So my son played basketball in high school. And we were at a basketball game. And some dads were sitting behind us watching the game. And they were talking about, one of them was saying that coins come up heads more than tails. 
And the dad next to him said, no, it doesn't. And yes, it does. You know, they're going back and forth arguing. And then he says, I have a friend who coaches soccer or refs soccer. And, you know, they flip a coin at the beginning, I guess, to see who starts on offense or defense. And um, so, and he said, and, and my friend says it comes up heads way more than it comes up tails. Well, this was bothering me a little bit that they're sitting, well, first of all, I'm trying to watch a game. But second of all, they're sitting here back, back here arguing about something that, and I, so I turned around and I said, I said, no, that's not true. If it's a fair coin, it doesn't come up heads more often. And he tried to argue with me a little bit. So I said, here, I'll prove it. And I took a coin out of my purse and I flipped it and I only flipped it 10 times, which is not very many times. Okay. I flipped it 10 times. Now, I was taking a chance because it was quite possible that I'd get more heads than tails, but I lucked out. It came up heads five times. It came up tails five times. And I said, see, and then they shut up. So that's just an example of empirical or statistical probability. And in that particular instance, my probability of heads or tails came out exactly what the theoretical was, but that's pretty unusual. I got super lucky on that one. So the difference is this is theoretical based just on the number of possible outcomes and the number of ways E can happen. Empirical is based on observations. So your bottom number is the total number of observations. So like in my example, my total number of observations was 10. And if I was doing the probability of getting tails, I flipped the coin 10 times and five times it came up to be tails. And in this case, the empirical or observed probability came out to be what the theoretical probability is. That's pretty unusual. You understand that I actually could have gotten all 10 of them could have come up heads. That would have been unusual if it was uh, not if it was a fair coin. In fact, if it came up heads 10 times, I would have thought there's something wrong with this coin. That's what it would probably mean. So those are two types of probability. Raise your hand if you think I should never tell that story again. It's act, it is actually a true story. Okay, then um, this slide, remember I was just talking about the law of large numbers. That's what this slide is about. It says, as an experiment is repeated over and over, the empirical probability will approach and eventually kind of level out to the theoretical or actual probability. There's one more type of probability. This one we don't run into very much, but you've probably seen this. And this is called subjective probability. This is not ideal. It's not based on observations or outcomes. It's, it's purely a guess or an estimate. So they, the example they give is a doctor may feel a patient has a 90% chance of a full recovery. Now, if that's based on that patient's situation and previous observations, it would become empirical probability, but it's purely the doctor looking at this guy and saying, I, I think he has about 90% chance of a full recovery. That's just his educated guess, and that would be subjective. We won't run into that very much. Okay, this is an important slide right here. This is a very important thing to know. So I actually want you to write this down. The probability of an event E is always between zero and one. Write that down. The probability of any event is a number between zero and one. And I'm going to write that down. And I'm writing it as the inequality. Notice they've written this like an inequality that we saw in the skills review. The probability of an event is between zero and one inclusive, meaning that it can be zero and it can be one. Now they've given a little range there. Notice that if the probability is zero, and I want you, because I usually put this on the test, um, I don't know if I'll be able to 
on the online test, but I usually put this on the actual test. If uh, the probability is zero, that that event is impossible. It can't happen. For example, the probability that it's going to snow today is zero. It's impossible. If an event has to happen, so for example, the probability that this class will end, that probability is one, and the word that I want you to associate with that is certain. So something that cannot happen has a probability of zero and is impossible. Anything that's certain, anything with a probability of one is certain to happen. And notice they give if, if the probability is 0.5, that means there's an even chance of it happening or not happening. And then if it's between 0 and 0.5, notice they're calling it unlikely. And between 0.5 and 1 is certain. Now, uh, for unusual, unusual, and we should talk about this. Let's write this down. An unusual event generally has a probability of less than 0 0.05. You can write that down. I'm going to try to write it standing up here. Unusual is probability less than or equal to 0 0.05. So it'd be way down here. Then let's see. One of the last things we're going to that I want to make sure we talk about is complementary events. This is uh, this is talking about the complement of event E. And notice the notation. So they have this this whole sample space in this diagram. And let's suppose that our uh, sample space, maybe it's the set of possible um, rolls of two dice. And I do have a sample space to show you for that. It says um, E complement, which they're showing as, I'm going to put this on here, E and E complement, and the whole thing is the sample space. We say the complement of an event E is, the, is called E prime. And together, though, if you put E and E prime all together, you get the entire sample space. So the probability of an event plus the probability of its complement have to be 1. Let me give you a good example of how that's used. So like if the probability that it will rain is 0.1, the complement of raining would be not raining. So if the probability of rain is 0.1. If the probability of rain is 0.1, then the probability it won't rain is going to be 1 minus 0.1 which is 0.9. And then together, the two probabilities add up to 1. So this would be like E, and this would be E comment. Occasionally, instead of, uh, instead of that apostrophe, they'll write it like this with a C. I've seen it both ways in different books. And so what they're telling is the probability of an event plus the probability of its complement has to be 1. Also, if you want to find the probability of an event, you can do 1 minus the probability of the complement or the probability of a complement is 1 minus the probability of the event, which is what I used here. Okay. 
in the um, unit two folder on the le in lessons, um, you will see a sample space handout, and I would encourage you to to print that out so you can use it on the test. Kayla, do you have a question? Yeah, is that a like a one next to the e in the parentheses? This? Yeah. No, it's like an apostrophe. Oh, okay. Okay, it's like an apostrophe, and it means complement. Okay, thank you. Okay. So, yeah, no, it's not a one. Make it slanted so you can tell it's not a one. Maybe I didn't slant it enough. I kind of like the little C better because it doesn't look like a one, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So another book we I taught out of before used this, but I think this book uses the prime. Sometimes they call it prime, E prime. For the pot instead of apostrophe, they might say they might call that prime, E prime. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Kendra, do you have a question? I'll wait till after the presentation. Okay. Um, let's let me look. I only had a couple more slides on here. Um, let me see if we need to go over those because I know class is over. Um, you can look at the PowerPoint on your own to see the things that I didn't show. No, I didn't really skip anything. I would like to show you though. I think I will show you the. Um, have a couple of things and I understand if you need to go if you need to go uh, but this is the sample space handout that's in your lesson unit 2 folder and it shows the whole sample space for a deck of cards and for rolling two dice so that might come at, come in handy you might want to print that out to use on the test um, another thing I wanted to show you I thought this was kind of interesting is I found another sample space for a pair of dice, possible rolls. So then you're rolling two dice. And what I like about this picture is it shows on the first die, you could get a number one through six. And on the second die, you could also get a one through six. And so if you use the fundamental principle of counting, you'd see I have six possibilities for the first die and six possibilities for the second die, which means there are 36 possible outcomes here. So when you're answering questions about rolling a pair of dice, there are 36 possible outcomes. So six, six times six is 36 possible outcomes. And that becomes the bottom number for all your probabilities when you're rolling a pair of dice. And you could see how what the different ones are. So I could have one, 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 two, one, three. Do you see that one on the first one could go with any of these things here? That's going to make it super messy if I do all of them. So you see I have six outcomes if the first die is a one, and the six outcomes if the first die is two. We'll talk more about rolling dice next time. Be sure and do your chapter three skills review and do um, so that you can start your 3.1 homework and you have over the weekend to complete those two and bring your questions next week. And I will try to have your tests graded by Monday. So have a great weekend. And if, if you didn't get caught up, if things didn't go so good with unit one, think of this as a new start. Print off the things you should print out. Read everything that I've provided for you. And do all the homework over the weekend so that you are ready to go and ahead for this unit. Have a great weekend.